I work with two amazing women, Heather Wilson and Christine Powell. Their official title is feeding therapist and they do the bulk of the intervention. They do all the direct work with the children and most of the parent training for which I supervise. So the clients we serve, we work with kids between the ages of 18 months and eight years. I say ideally because we do accept clients that are a little bit older, but we are cautious about doing so in that um, outcomes are often moderated with kids that are older. So much easier to intervene on this problem when you're two as opposed to 12. We work with kids in, uh, across the Lower Mainland and we have helped a few families in Kamloops. Sessions take place in home and, and because of our schedules we now work a lot in schools and many funding sources are used. So autism funding, uh, parents apply to charities, and most, I, I would say 30% of parents or 40% pay out of pocket. So we know that feeding problems occur often in young children with developmental disabilities, and research has reported uh, prevalence figures as high as 90%. We also know that um, kids without a diagnosis also exhibit um, some sort of atypical eating at, uh, uh, during the early years. This typically peaks around two or three, and then by five or six, uh, children will start to eat those foods again that they previously had dropped. So we know that with children without any sort of diagnosis, they can go through sort of a, a, a intermittent phase of picky eating. So what does the research say about autism and feeding problems? Anecdotally, we know that this is quite a common problem among kids. You'll hear parents and teachers and and, and other caregivers report about the great beige diet that many of these kids adhere to. Uh, there's one study to date that's compared, that I'm aware of, that has compared the patterns of eating between kids with and without this diagnosis. And the results show that children with ASD indeed have more uh, restricted patterns of eating, in particular, more selective in terms of the types of foods they accept, so limiting range of especially fruits and veggies, and more, um, uh, limited range of textures or some more inclined to eat foods that are soft and texture or pureed. So research from this study also su suggests that we need to intervene earlier because um, like I mentioned children go through this picky eating phase around the age of two. Parents become alarmed by the fact that they're only accepting five foods haul them off to a pediatrician. The pediatrician says, look, it's okay, they're growing, they're gaining weight, let's just ride it out and see if it's, it's, it's probably just a phase. But as, we, as this study shows, I mean, all the participants were between the ages of five and eight, which suggests this becomes an enduring problem. So rather than waiting to see if we can ride it out, let's intervene when they're three, as opposed to eight. And again, so much easier to change behavior when they're small. All right, so the Williams and Trek did a follow-up study where they um, wanted to see what characteristics of autism influenced food selectivity, so you know, common characteristics, rigidity uh, around routines, insistence on sameness, sensory processing issues, did these factors, um, were these the reasons why kids were so selective in what they ate? And the study found no evidence to support these commonly held assumptions. But the data did suggest that feeding problems were related to family food preferences. So kids that were selective in what they ate came from families that were also selective in what they ate. And in the general feeding uh, nutrition literature, there is a lot of evidence to show that if you're a picky eater as a parent, you tend to raise a child that's a picky eater. And it's simply based on exposure, so not exposing kids to enough foods, um, especially at an early age. And they, uh, they, do, they do say that this is more supposition than fact, but they end in their discussion this um, question of which came first, the chicken nugget or the egg. So do parents, um, do kids start dropping foods and parents start to lose hope and start becoming more restrictive in the types of foods they eat simply to try and just serve one food at a, a meal? Or is it the, the, um, the opposite where parents are picky from the beginning and um, modeling poor, poor choices and or, or <clears throat> uh, restricted choices and foods for the children. So types of feeding problems. This is, these are the types of problems we see in our, our practice and are commonly described about in the, the feeding literature. So food selectivity based on type, so eating only certain food groups, uh, specifically carbohydrates. Texture, so consuming 
many kids we work with will only eat food when it's presented on its own, but not in mixed dishes. So multiple textures presented at once is super challenging. Brand, eating one only one type of yogurt, appearance, eating it presented in only one way or color. Lots of kids we work with have oral motor delays, so lacking the prerequisite skills to learn how to chew. Tube dependence, so that's total food refusal, not accepting anything orally. Uh, gagging and vomiting, no, lack of self-feeding, inappropriate mealtime behaviors, and refusing to eat in public places, so eating at home but never at grandma's or at restaurants, or the opposite. How does feeding, a process so integral to health and well-being, go awry? We know it's a combination of factors, in specifically physical and behavioral. Success with eating requires uh, intact ana anatomical structures and proper neurological functioning. And if there's any impairment in the anatomy or neurology of a child, it's likely lead to a feeding problem. So here's some examples, cerebral palsy, uh, gastrointestinal disease, a choking incident, a major surgery are all sort of physical or medical um, beginnings to a feeding problem. This is a great quote by Mary Louise Kerwin who does a lot of research in this field <clears throat> and just shows how quickly this, this problem can occur and how um, difficult it is to change. Food ingestion, when, when is paired with nausea or discomfort, the food then becomes aversive. Basic research has shown that, has demonstrated that food aversions can be created in a single trial and the, these food aversions are persistent and strong. So Christine and I worked with a little boy to give an example of this, who only who choked on a hot dog just once, and after that dropped all his foods and would only eat chicha puffs. And this was for a few years, and it makes sense. Chicha puffs are, are light, they dissolve easily in the mouth, so for him it was a safe food to consume. But just one choking incident turned him off food altogether, which is pretty, uh, pretty dramatic. In our work, the factors associated with feeding, 79% of the kids we worked with have had some sort of developmental delay, 9% have had uh, gastrointestinal disease, 28% uh, have had oral motor delays, and then 7% some other medical condition. And then only 16% of the kids we work with have um, had no diagnosis and no medical or physical issue. So it's simply behavioral. I left a slide out. So what happens is it starts off as something physical or medical, and then once the, the, the idea is sometimes it starts off as just something behavioral, like these, the 16% of the kids we work with. Um, however, with some children, it starts off as a physical problem um, and then morphs into a behavioral issue over time. So once the physical aspects of the problem are treated, kids continue to refuse to try new foods simply because it's been reinforced by parents withdrawing their demand. So why, why a behavioral approach? It's still a relatively new area of research in applied behavior analysis, but it's shown to be effective in, behavioral strategies have been shown effective in promoting change in eating behavior. Uh, we, data is collected continuously to track progress, and this is especially important given that progress is so slow in the beginning. So it helps us stay accountable, and it also helps us and parents see that in, progress is indeed happening. And a behavioral approach is most effective if the medical and physical reasons have been treated or managed. We're pretty much useless if kids are still continuing to feel pain while they're trying to new food, trying to eat new food. There, there's no hope in, in terms of our strategies working. So in our practice, we define uh, feeding problems as being motivationally based or skill based. <clears throat> Motivation meaning that the feeding problem is maintained by the child's environment, whether it's a fear or a, um, uh, it's about effort, so it's more effortful for the child to consume this food, therefore it leads to uh, problem behavior, or perhaps they have a hypersensitivity to it and that, I don't know, the, the, the feeling of a mixed or rice in their mouth is uh, unbelievably aversive for them. And the other type of problem is simply skill-based, so just um, teaching children the necessary skills for, for chewing. So for whatever reason, lack of experience or some physical issue, they've not been able to uh, develop the prerequisites for chewing. The model of support we endorse is ecological in scope. There's three levels of assessment to, to assessment intervention. The first level being child-related, so understanding the specifics, the setting, the structure that um, trigger 
food refusal behavior as well as the consequences that maintain it long term. And this is done by conducting a functional behavior assessment. And the outcome of that is this three-term contingency, which gives us the following information. What are the behaviors of concern? What, what is specifically the antecedent event that's triggering these, these food refusal behaviors or problematic feeding behaviors? Is it a request to try a new food? Is it a fear? Um, is it a request to try a new texture? So, so often that's effort, more effort for the child. For, so something is making this an aversive event for the child, which leads them to use a, engage in a bunch of problem behaviors um, in order to get their parent to remove the demand. 90, I don't know, I don't have the actual figure, but I would guess 95% of the time it's escape or motivated, so kids are using problem behavior to get out of eating. The second layer of assessment and intervention is, so this addresses the child, child-related issues, then we want to look at the way um, the parent-child interaction, eating doesn't happen in isolation, especially when kids are young, parents are often feeding their child, so we want to understand how the child is influencing the parent in the context of a meal routine. And it's based on the work of Patterson and his colleagues, and the core of their research is this four-step escape-driven process, which is um, parents give a demand to try a new food, child responds by refusing or crying or tantruming, parents find this so aversive they then withdraw their demand, um, which reinforces the child to keep engaging in problem behavior in the future, and the child immediately calms down, which reinforces the parent to withdraw their demand more often. And over time, the parent and child become increasingly unaware of the consequences of their behavior and get stuck or trapped in this interaction that reciprocally reinforces child problem behavior and ineffective parenting. So by the time, by the time we meet kids or the families, parents have stopped offering foods altogether or they will attempt it once and then they give up. All right, so the third level assessment is understanding the broader mealtime context. We start our treatment outside of the natural meal routine, but our ultimate goal is to embed it back within the, the family routine, typically a dinner routine. So understanding the specifics of the routine in terms of who's present, the setting, the seating arrangement, utensils, what are the goals and values embedded within that routine as well as any stressors that are present that may in fact the, um, may impact the effectiveness of the plan. And we do this by um, interviewing parents and asking them what their vision of a successful routine is. And we stopped doing this, we had a meeting a while ago, we stopped doing this in the beginning because when we first meet parents they're so skeptical of this even working that they can't even engage in a conversation about what their vision of a successful routine would look like. At that point they just want to say, just prove me wrong, get my kid eating. Mm -hmm. So um, we wait until we've had a lot of success and parents are starting to feel more optimistic then they can start to articulate what exactly a dinner routine would look like for them. Right? So it's much easier if we interview them later. Um, and we know that if we don't do this piece, then we're going to develop a plan that's not going to last. Um, if, it's, if it's not contextually appropriate, it's not going to work. Uh, here's an overview of the model in which we, we uh, use. First of all, there's an assessment, which I'll go through. And then that information is used to develop a plan. And then the first part of implementation starts with the feeding therapist. And once we have success with, with the kids and have a good understanding of how to successfully get kids to eat new foods, then we transfer the support procedures to the parents. Um, and we often do that outside of the meal routine and then we transfer it into the meal routine once they're fluent and comfortable and can, and can do it all in the midst of many distractions. And then finally, once parents are feeding their kids new foods without us present, we move into maintenance support. So we fade our support, we go from four times a week working with parents to maybe once or twice to then once every two to three weeks to um, once a month or so. And by, by three months of maintenance support, they're typically sick of us and want just email interactions. <laughs> so assessment. So there's many aspects or components to the assessment. First of all, um, understanding if there's any physical or medical reasons, factors that might be affecting eating. The, the two most common with the kids that we work with are gastro, 
esophageal reflux disorder as well as constipation. So have those two issues been treated because if they haven't been then there's going to be zero motivation for the child to accept new foods. Um, and then oral motor assessment, so consulting with uh, an occupational therapist or speech language pathologist about whether or not the child has the, the oral motor capabilities to um, chew the food and swallow. Uh, has there been a dietary assessment? Is the child consuming adequate nutri calories and nutrients? And then our piece is the, the feeding interview, so gathering information about past techniques parents have used, current techniques, um, and uh, other aspects of feeding. And then, like I said, a routine assessment happens later. What is the family's vision of a successful meal routine? So all this information is then used to develop a behavioral plan of intervention, which has um, three features. First of all, we need to motivate kids to do um, something that is incredibly challenging for them. Um, what are the strategies that are in place to teach the child new skills around eating? This is especially important when we're teaching kids to chew. And then how do we ensure problem behavior is not rewarded? So after we develop the plan, then we begin with uh, implementing intervention with the feeding therapist. So there's many reasons why we do this. And the, the, I think the biggest one is it's asking parents to do this from the get-go is, is going to lead to failure. Um, parents, by the time we've met them, are completely burned out. They're pessimistic about this even working. Um, they have a long history with their child of their child refusing. And so we want to, I, I almost feel like we want to protect them from any sort of fa future failure by making the change for them and priming their child to be successful with them. We don't have that history, so we're more likely to have success with motivating kids to try new foods. And uh, it, we're less likely to experience such an inten intense burst in behaviors. And if there is a burst in behaviors, which often happens in the beginning, it's, um, it's easier for her to en endure it, which I can speak personally about trying to do a bedtime routine with my daughter. It was 10,000 times more challenging. <laughs> so feeding sessions happen four to five times a week, ideally. So sessions are 30 minutes to an hour. And it's in a distraction-free room, meaning parents aren't uh, participating in the, uh, the early stages of the intervention. And the objective of these sessions are for the child to practice tasting and consuming new foods. We want to um, give them as much exposure because we know that from research um, it can take up to 15 to 20 opportunities or practices with consuming a food before they'll incorporate it into their diet. So we spend, we, we call them tasting sessions. Data is collected on everything, so I'll show you in my cases uh, examples of how we collect data. And the therapist continues to work with the child until they're accepting at least 10 foods, 10 to 15 ideally, and then we transfer the, we then work with the parents. Um, and parents aren't present, but we videotape sessions and often just plunk them onto their computer afterwards so they can watch them. The next phase is parent training. Um, and again, we start, we, we, we start with just one-on-one -on -one with the parent and the child, and then once they're successful and feeling confident, we move it back into the meal routine. Um, then we fade uh, to once every three weeks to once a month and follow up via email or phone calls. With many kids, there's setbacks, so we'll, we'll provide booster sessions. Um, and then I like to follow families for at least a year or so in some capacity. And the objective during uh, maintenance is to empower parents to feel self-sufficient in their use of strategies. We don't stop until they can feed their child a new food without us present. And uh, this is also the time where we develop plans for preventing or um, any, uh, any sort of relapse in the child's eating or helping them um, think about strategies that could help overcome some sort of relapse. Because inevitably it's going to happen, especially if the child has, um, falls ill. It's quite common for them to start to drop foods again. So in terms of our outcomes today, because I'm going to talk a little bit about our work and the successes we've had, this is how we as a team define a success. We want kids eating, accepting, chewing, and swallowing at least 15 table foods from across major food groups. We want parents to be able to successfully feed their child a new food without us present. We want outcomes to have maintained beyond six months. 
And for kids that are on tubes, they're no longer dependent on, on extraordinary methods of artificial feeding. So the next part of this presentation is just going through um, three cases based on a particular problem. The first, we separate our clients in terms of the type of feeding problem. So the first is food selectivity based on type or texture. So of the kids we've worked with, the 22 of them have had this issue and the average age has been 5.9. So typically we don't get to help until the kids are older, which is a bit of a problem. But range has been 2 to 11. Average length of intervention is 19.7 weeks, but it can happen, or I guess the longest was 37 weeks. And hours of intervention was, the average is 48.6 hours from start to finish, so from assessment to follow-up. And so our outcomes, we've had, out of 22 cases, we've had 19 have been successful in terms of how we define a successful outcome. So this is Sam, he has a diagnosis of autism. He's six, uh, he was six at the start of the intervention. He lives at home with his older brother who also is on the spectrum. And his feeding issue was food selectivity by type and texture. So he had a limited range of foods in his diet as well. He uh, would only ex uh, consume foods when they're presented on their own. He was very adverse to mixed dishes. He ate all his meals in front of the computer or TV when we first met him. And his biggest issue or his most um, prominent problem behavior was gagging. So he would just gag at the sight of food, even which is so punishing for for him and made him far less motivated to even try a food. So here's his plan of intervention. Again, it's about motivation. So if kids aren't hungry, they're not gonna to wanna to try new foods or um, try the food in order to earn the, the food reinforcer. So he had to be hungry. So three to four hours prior to a session, he wasn't allowed any food, only water. He was, his access to reinforcers needed to be limited. He had free range of all screens in his house and because that was the most powerful reinforcer we had to convince his mom to limit his access to some of them so we could use them to motivate him. Choice was a powerful piece of this uh, intervention so trying to find any opportunity to offer him choice, types of foods, what he was going to earn, how many bites, stimulus fading so slowly increasing the size of the bite over time, the high probability sequence so once kids are willingly doing or displaying some of those easier behaviors, using them as a way to motivate them to try um, to do something more difficult, which is eating the food. So there's a lot of licking, uh, a series of rapid trials of getting kids to lick the food, followed by reinforcement, which then creates momentum for them to try the food. And it's remarkably effective in, in getting kids to eat. Giving him predictability about how how we were gonna do this, so showing him visually, just writing it out, how many, how many bites we were gonna get him to eat, and then um, when it would be over and what he would earn. Christine delivered reinforcement contingent on bites as well as um, success for completing his session. She uh, prevented him from escaping because the function of his behavior was escape. She had to um, use an escape extinction procedure, so, um, continue to present the demand in, the, uh, in response to problem behavior. And you'll see her wrestling him back to the table. And then finally a response cost procedure because he was so challenging, we um, decided a better approach would be that he got three warnings and if he continued to leave the table then he would lose access to computer or iPad. And then when we moved into parent training, Sam is, another one of Sam's issues is he never stays seated. He's always fidgeting, he's always getting distracted, which is why his mother would plunk him in front of the TV or computer, because he'd be more willing to eat food there. And, um, but that's not their desired routine. They wanted him to sit at a kitchen table with everybody present. So we instituted this beat the clock strategy, which was, um, we used for maintenance foods, so foods that were mastered, so they were considered relatively easy for Sam. He had to continue to eat, and if he ate all his food within a desired amount of time, he'd earn the, the reinforcer. Uh, however, if he got up from his chair, or, or if he didn't earn, um, sorry, if the clock, um, if the timer went and he hadn't eaten his food, he wouldn't earn the reinforcer. But the way we did it is, if he was staying seated and eating, 
we didn't turn the timer on. We only turned the timer on as if as, um, when he left the table or if he started to get distracted. And that seemed sufficient in, in terms of getting him to stay motivated and eat. So this is Sam's um, work with Christine. So by the time they were done their intensive sessions together, he was eating, what did I write, 27 new foods. And we knew that he would be, because of his age, he's six, and he had a very limited diet. We had to start easy with him and slowly um, um, yeah, ease him into this whole idea of trying new foods. So we started with foods that closely resembled the foods he was currently accepting, so a bunch of different types of crackers to start. And then we moved to um, more and more challenging foods. And by the end, I think you had tried one mixed dish, which was this one, right? Pasta with tomato sauce? Yeah. Well, even grilled cheese. Was... Oh, yeah, that's considered a mixed dish, which is quite. And so this is how we measure, this is sessions to mastery. So um, a mastered session is when a child's eating a full size bite, 90% of the time. And it had to happen for two consecutive sessions. Um, so this is the, the mastery line. So in, on average, it would take Sam about four to five sessions before he'd master a new food. And some took longer. Grilled cheese took about 11 sessions to master. So it took him 11, 11 sessions, which is you know 20 trials per session. So that's, like, that's over 200 tastings of a food before he would eat a full-size bite. And that's the same with pasta and tomato sauce. And here's how we take trial by trial data. So this is pasta with tomato sauce. Um, the blue diamonds are acceptances and the red squares are gags. And then the green triangles are refusals. So he would, he started to accept, uh, accept the food quite quickly and refusals were almost, well, after the first session they were zero um, times, but the gagging continued for quite a long time. But it, this is why I always try and convince OTs that it, with repeated exposure and, and practice, gagging will reduce over time. And he's a good example of that. Uh, so one of the contextual, consider, contextual fit considerations for this boy is um, because his family uh, wanted to eat together, uh, it was, and I think it took us about six months to convince his mom that we could actually do this and she could have, sit down and have a meal with both boys present. Her concern was that the older brother, who also has a diagnosis, would um, refuse to eat with Sam because he was grossed out by the food Sam was eating. So we implemented an adjunct behavior support plan, which was simply a contract with the older brother. The mom, the mom did this all, didn't she? She created this contract. Yeah, I gave her the strategy. Yeah, she did it. So tonight we get to eat, you get to eat X. So this is for the brother. Tonight Sam will, so his brother got some control over the situation, so he got to choose which foods uh, Sam was going to try at dinner. And he also got to choose how many bites Sam would get to eat. And then tonight, this was the reinforcers that the older brother could work for. And then this was the, the description of the three strikes rule. So if you leave the table, you're going to lose access to the iPad. And they went from both boys eating dinner together with Sam only eating one or two bites of the foods to now Sam eating a meal with his brother. So that's pretty exciting, especially since the mom was so resistant to even trying this. Sam's now eating 30 plus foods. His mom's able, has fed him 10 new foods without Christine present. It took a lot of time. <laughs> 53 and a half hours of intensive work with Christine, 20.7 hours of parent training. We're still monitoring. It's still, I think mom's almost ready to end services um, because she's asking Christine, how do we end? So there, there's a good clue that that's going to happen soon. <laughs> but um, it was 12.25 hours, so Christine sees them once every two weeks or so. And now mostly just works with both boys eating together with mom. So oral motor delays is the second type of problem, which is that failure to transition to table foods. We've helped 11 kids, and the average age is four, so a lot younger than kids with picky eating issues. And the length of intervention is 33 weeks double the hours, 76 hours it's taken us. Um, and average number of foods kids are eating by the end of intervention is 18 new table foods. And we've had success with 10 of the 11. And the reason why the one case wasn't successful is because they ran out of money. This is a very expensive process. So how do we teach chewing? Uh, there's a number of strategies used, oral stimulation act 
activities, tongue lateralization activities, shaping, reinforcement, and then always you can't be effective unless you have a plan, um, prevent es escape behaviors. Oral stimulation and tongue lateralization, there's no research to show that this is actually helpful, um, I think. It would be interesting to see uh, if you add this to a, uh, an intervention, do you get quicker change as opposed to not add it. But with a lot of the kids, simply because they haven't had higher textured foods in their mouth, we think it's important to desensitize their mouth with non-nutritive items, so stimulating their their face, their cheeks, their chin, and upper lip, providing stimulation to their tongue with a knuck brush, which is like a baby uh, toothbrush. So swiping the sides of their mouth and the, the, the tongue and the insides of the cheeks. This also promotes tongue lateralization. If you provide stimulation to the sides of their tongues, they'll naturally move their tongue to the, the, to the side in which that stimulation is happening. So teaching kids to move their tongue left and right, because we need to be able to move the food onto our molars to then chew it. Lots of kids we work with who have oral motor delays don't know how to blow. And um, sometimes they just have a fear of anything being placed to their mouth. So this is a nice initial step for them, teaching them to uh, use blow or teach them to blow and play with um, blow toys, whistles, what have you. Licking food from corners of your mouth. So again, practicing that, um, that movement of moving your tongue to the left and right. Uh, doing some imitation activities and then with some kids we've had to hide food into their cheek pockets and teach them how to to um, to fish them out of their cheeks so also practicing uh, lateralization skills and then to teach chewing we use a shaping procedure where we reinforce closer and closer approximations of the target behavior starting with low effort behaviors often safe behaviors, so chewing tubes or straws. And then as kids show success and be problem behavior remains low, we gradually increase our expectations. So this is kind of the sequence. We teach kids to chew tubes and straws. Um, left and right side and molars, we do some, most of the kids we work with don't know how to even chew um, a, a tube at first. They have no strength in their jaw, and so continuous chewing is, is extremely effortful. So, you know, we shape that even one chew, two chews, uh, 10 continuous chews is our goal. Then we move to multiple solids. Our favorite are popcorn twists. We've gone through everything. Popcorn twists, mum-mums, and cheesies. So getting kids to practice chewing an actual food, but it's a safe food in that it melts within two seconds. And then soft table foods, which are everything from cooked carrots, uh, avocado, pear, a toast with butter. And then finally progressing to uh, table foods, just regular table foods. So here's Jason. He has a diagnosis of autism and Downs syndrome. He was five when we started, and he had an oral motor delay. He couldn't lateralize food, and he couldn't chew. And he also was highly selective in terms of the period food he ate. And he lived at home with his parents and his older brother, who's also on the spectrum. Here's his data. So this is a exa good example of when learning occurs, and then he was off to the races. So this is... This is tongue lateralization. So he couldn't, he couldn't move his tongue to the left and right, so we actually taught him how to do that and measured his success. And at first it was 0% of trials and then it slowly increased to 100% of trials. And then this is chewing a veggie chip. So the first multiple solid we introduced to him, he had no idea how to chew. And then eventually he got it. And after that, every food we introduced, he immediately started chewing. Contextual con fit considerations for him when he was eating together with his family, uh, and it was maintenance foods. His mom, his mom was easily overwhelmed, um, and so we agreed that during meals where he's with his family, he can have non-contingent access to the iPad, meaning he had free access. It was playing in front of him, but if he stopped eating, then she would pause the iPad and prompt him to continue to eat. And that seemed to be a good fit for her in the early stages of maintenance support. We also had this issue that whenever Jason, if he did refuse, his, his older brother would get really upset by that and run away from the table. So we, we just had to teach him what, why Jason was escalating, why he was crying, and taught him how to ignore his brother. 
And then again, I, his mom was overwhelmed with all the responsibilities she had, so we enlisted more social supports because we know there's a lot of um, a lot said in the feeding literature about the importance of training more than just that primary caregiver. And so Heather trained both his grandmas on how to feed Jason, just so others. And we also train school teams, interventionists, um, just so that parents feel like they have support and someone else is continuing to master or practice those foods. Jason was eating 20 foods when we finished. He was, it was 53 hours of work with Heather and only 12 hours of parent training. So that's a good example of making him super successful so then the transfer of the parent is virtually seamless and then just three and a half hours of monitoring and 24 weeks. It was, it was relatively fast for a child with an oromotor delay. Uh, okay, and the last type of feeding problem we work with are kids that are dependent on tubes. Uh, we've worked with six kids and average age is four and um, average hours of intervention is 86 hours. <coughs> And so for three kids, the tubes have been removed. One child, he's now eating 10 plus purees. Oh no, that was one that we stopped after 10 purees because his, his uh, reflux disorder was so severe, um, it was impossible to continue. And really his mom just wanted him eating a few tablespoons just to get some experience of eating food orally. Another little boy we've been working with, he's on 25 purees and 11 table foods and we're still working with him. And then finally the other boy, which I'm gonna talk about now is he we taught him to eat 10 purees and he's on 16 table foods and his mom is now able to cut his tube feeds in half so more of his calories are coming from food as opposed to formula so this is Hayden Hayden lives in Fort St. John he's he was six when we met him and he has a diagnosis of autism he lives at home he's an only child he was born prematurely at 26 weeks he was in the hospital for four or five months and on oxygen for about a year he has reflux disorder and he was eating 100% through a G-tube. So the main strategies to get Hayden to accept pureed foods was demand fading. So starting with just an empty knuck brush and getting him used to opening his mouth and accepting something within it and then slowly increasing the, the size of the bite. Delivering reinforcement contingent on him meeting the expectations of the particular trial. And because Hayden had such severe reflux, he spent his you know, first three years of life vomiting. His mom said he would vomit 16 times a day. So, and it was really interesting getting her perspective because this kid expels everything. I've never met a child like this. Most kids we work with where it's a chewing uh, issue is that they swallow things whole. And that's the problem. But for Hayden, he wouldn't, he wouldn't swallow. Everything came back out. Um, and it started with the puree. So, He'd accept a bite, and then um, he would immediately stick his tongue out and wipe it all along the bottom of his lip, and then pick it back up off his lip and then consume it. It was like a way for him to manage um, the texture in his mouth. It was pretty bizarre, and it was really hard for us to change that behavior. And at first, we would just wipe it off his tongue and or off his chin and represent it, and we learned then that actually wasn't helping because the, the portion on the spoon got less and less, and so we were just reinforcing him, wiping his bottom lip, if that makes any sense. So instead we would, if he stuck his tongue out, if any food larger than a pea size um, um, appeared on his bottom lip, we immediately wiped his mouth, withheld the reinforcer, and represented the trial. And that seemed to do the trick. And when it came to, I don't show his table foods, him learning to chew and eat table foods, but we literally, if the multiple solid came back out on his lip, we'd push it, we'd roll our thumb and push it back in. And uh, after two days of doing that, he stopped expelling. But it was a lot of effort. He's quite brilliant with his tongue. <laughs> hey. All right, so this is how data, so the first period we fed him was vanilla yogurt. And this is expels, since that was the most um, frequent problem behavior we experienced with him. So this is nook brush, or nook or a dab on a nook brush. And at first, expels were low because it's literally barely detectable. He, it was the smallest of smallest amounts. Sometimes we do half a dab, three quarters of a dab. <laughs> Dabs also have their own measurements. All right, and then 
Once Christine had success with that, she moved to a spoon and put a dab on the spoon. Expels were low, so she thought she could increase the size of the bite, and then expels increased to almost 80% of the time. That's when we ran into all the problems. So she sliced back to a dab, expels dropped. She increased to a quarter, expels stayed low. So she started to increase the size of the bite, and the, the expels stayed within the 20% cutoff. And then this is parent training. So mom then was able to take over and expels continue to stay low. And all this intervention happened with the pureed food within a week. So we taught him to eat 10 foods within, yeah, six days. So Hayden, because he's on a tube and we want to wean him off his tube, we took uh, measurements of how much he was eating of pureed across a day. And this is where we started. This is eight teaspoons in a day. Um, then he went home back to Fort St. John and his mom kept track of data and then we started he came back to Vancouver and we started chewing so pureed dropped again because we spent so much of our energy on getting him to try um, chew solid foods and then after that his mom kept going with the pureed and now he's up to 240 teaspoons which is five cups of food a day so his mom's cut his tube feeds down by half. This was her weekly goals. So one of our job, or, or a major part of our job, especially for this mom who lives so far away, is to set a goal for her each week and have her achieve it. So, um, and then this this was the this is the five cups goal. So we the 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 line is our goal, and then she keeps track of whether or not, or then we graph her data. So when she's a, she's reached the line um, for two consecutive days, then we increase change our criteria. So, so far it's been progress and now she's up to five cups. And then here's an example of, <laughs> this is the data she sends us. So she literally will, here's breakfast, 14 tablespoons, snack, 15 tablespoons. She'll tell us how much of it was of each. She also sends this to the dietitian. And now we do this with um, table foods where we weigh them every meal. We bought her a, a scale as her uh, yeah, we did. It's a very cool scale. She, she got to go home with a purple scale. It's great. Uh, here's Hayden's outcome. So um, he's, he's come to Vancouver twice. The first time he came for a week. The second time we did chewing and he came for two weeks. First, taught, it took us 18 hours to teach him to accept pureed foods, 13 hours of parent training. Um, and by, by the time he left, he was eating 10 purees. And solid foods, it was almost 50 hours. Poor kid saw a lot of us. And then parent training was 17 hours. And um, by the time he went home, he was consuming 15 table foods and his mom's added five new ones since then. Please help me thank Lauren for a great set. Thank you.